Well, good morning. My iPad did something strange that you don't want to happen when you're getting ready to speak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's, your, that's the only thing about not having paper. I just want to say, it's great that all this electronic stuff, but sometimes weird things happen to electronic stuff, don't they? That's not what we're talking about today, though. <clears throat> what we're talking about is the love of God. If, as John says, Apostle John, he said, God is love. If that is true, which it is, then you were created by love for love. And then that would mean that the image of God is one of love. And we were just made for love. And love has a lot to do foundationally with who we are. And uh, biblically, as Christians and all this, within us is an innate, innate, inborn desire to be loved. Really, I, and I believe everybody is, every child is born with a desire to be loved and to be loved perfectly. To be loved perfectly is without condition, right? The perfect love, the perfect kind of God kind of love. You were created for this. When I looked at the word love, I actually just looked to see how many times the word love was mentioned in the Bible. Overall, the whole thing, 700 times do we have love mentioned in the Bible. This is a big, this might be just an all surpassing subject. I mean, as far, love of God has a lot to do with the Bible. The New Testament uses the word love of, uh, 260 times. And the gospel used the word love, not just Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, 78 times. In today's message, I just did a little thing, a find, just to see how many times that I mentioned the word of love, and, I, and it's over 100 times. I'm certain you will hear that. <laughs> when I, got, I counted, I was like, oh, mercy, love. The Old Testament. It's so love started in the Old Testament, brother. Shama, the Israelites. I didn't tell him to shut up. I said, Shama. <laughs> the old, sometimes you got a quiet neck fella down on the front row. Shama. It was their confession of faith. Shama was the confession of faith for the Israelites. And it went like this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And they said this every day, every morning and every night. In fact, they taught their children to say it. And from the first words, as soon as the children could form sentences, they had to learn the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind strength. What is your soul? Huh? That has to do with your inner, your mind, your emotions. So love the Lord with your emotions. They were to love the Lord morning and night, all day long. It, was, it spoke of a devotion and a commitment to God. The love of God, I believe, is the secret to life. It's a secret to a full life. It's a secret to a life in Christ. It's a secret to obedience if you're struggling with obedience. It's a secret to freedom. If you're needing delivered for something, the love of God is the key. The love of God is at work. It's a work of God in us. It's something God does in us. We can't do to ourselves. So my question today is this in general, do you love God? We'll just start out with a real, just think about it. Do you love God? And I, and I would hope that most of us in here probably would say, well, yeah, I love God. But do we love God the way, I guess, maybe that he deserves to be loved? So I just want to start out with a prayer because I believe that God can do a work from the time that we're in here today. He can do something if our hearts are open to that. So God, I just ask that you put a desire in us today. Lord, you gave me this word, and there's something that you want to do in us as people. And God, we want to want what you want for us. So we just ask that desire would spring up in our hearts today. Desire would take hold of our hearts, that God, there would be a holy fire to take hold of us. That God, apathy would break off in the name of Jesus in this house. That apathy would break off of us. And God, there would be a fresh passion for God and the things of God. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. While we were yet sinners, Jesus first loved us, right? He paid the ultimate price when we least deserved it. He gave all. 
And I believe that it's important to all of us as believers that we have actually more than just head up here, that we actually have an experiential knowledge of God, which is a tacit knowledge of God, that we have an experience of the love of God. Without the experience of the love of God, our faith is just head knowledge, and we just have a religion. And there's no such thing as reckless love with people that just have religion. Reckless love knows no bounds. It's unconditional. And to love like that, we gotta have what God has. In the New Testament, Jesus said these things about love. And these are just a few, but I, I was just so impressed by them, I wanted to remind us of these things. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. This is extreme love. This Jesus, he's extreme about his love. This is the first and greatest commandment. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And second, love your neighbor as yourself. What? Is this possible? It must be. And then he says, but to you who are willing to listen, I say love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. These are the words of Jesus to us. God thinks we can do it. <laughs> he thinks we can do it. Now the apostle Paul, he said some things as well and I wanna remind you of it. He said love never fails. That, that, love never fails. You know, you can fail at a lot of things but if you fail at love, you've really failed at life. Paul knew what he was talking about when he said that love never fails. He says if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. There's a lot of noise in the church world, isn't there? He said, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. This love is something else, isn't it? Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is Love, hey, right on cue, good people. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Some believe actually love and then the colon would come after that. I kind of believe more that way. The Holy Spirit produces love in our life and it looks like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My scripture today is gonna be uh, John in the, in the book of John in uh, chapter 13 to start with. Interesting enough, the gospel of John the word love is used 57 times, and I told you that the whole New Testament had it 78 times. So John took up most of the love space 57 times. And 45 of those 57 are in the last eight chapters of the book of John. So what we actually see is Jesus is progressing in the book of John, and the story is progressing with Jesus moving closer and closer to the cross and actually giving up his life for you and me. He's talking more and more about what's in his heart. Love. It was love. In fact, in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, he uses the word love repeatedly look in the book of John. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says this, so now I am giving you a new commandment, a new commandment. Love each other, and remember we read the Shema, so what is this? He said, a new commandment, love each other just as I have loved you, and I think that's the key phrase, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now this is a command, and, I, and there's a difference between a command and an elective. Well, you know that, right? If, if you're, if you're, there's some classes that are absolutely required in college, and some you kind of get, well, maybe I won't, maybe I will, maybe I won't, right? But this is, is not an elective, it's not optional, it is required. Like Jesus says, this is it, folks. We have to do this. Love is essential. It's never optional. We would rather deal with love in like this conceptual thing. Let me just think about love. If I think about love, then I love. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> love in here doesn't even count. It's got to be demonstrated, acted upon. There has to be action. God's command to love him and our neighbor is actually an in invitation. I want you to think about this. It's actually an invitation to fully live. 
You are never going to fully live life until you let loose in love. I mean, you have not lived until you've got some enemies to love on. <laughs> Let me just say. I mean, think of enemies as absolute blessing to live life wide open. <laughs> I think we just have to change our perspective. <laughs> right, right? I mean, Jesus had enemies, and he fully loved them, and he actually died for them too. In John 13, 34 to 35, this love that Jesus is talking about, this word is actually a Greek word, agapeo. Agapeo is the verb form, and its noun form is agape. And there's four other words for love in the Greek language, but this agape word is like the crowning word for love. It is the top love. The other loves are all lesser than. Agape, essentially it means to seek the highest good of another. Agape is not about you, it's about someone else. It's about un unconditional love, and it's a God kind of love, and it is a God that, it is a God kind of love that we can, that we can move into as believers because of Christ in us. It's an act of our will. We can will or not will it, but we need to know that Jesus commanded it. When Jesus says, as I have loved you, this is what makes the commandment new. I want you to do it the way I do it. I want you to love the way I love. He's telling the disciples, it's a new commandment because now you're gonna move in a greater love. You're gonna love those that hate you. You're gonna love your enemies. Do what I'm doing. Jesus is telling them, I left the splendors and comforts of heaven because I loved you. And he's saying this to you today, and I want you to hear. He's saying this to his disciples, but I want you to hear as if Jesus is saying it to you. I have left the splendors of heaven because I love you. I called you knowing full well your faults. I taught you though you were stubborn and closed-minded. I showed you mercy when you messed up. I washed your feet on my way to death. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Can you hear the Lord saying that? I feel him in the room right now. Jesus, move out in these aisles. Remind these people of what you did for them and how much that you love them. It's an unchanging love. It's agape love. Love is a language that opens the blind eyes and deaf ears. When people can hear nothing else, they can hear love. Even when they're yank, angry, screaming, yelling, stomping their feet, somehow they can hear love. It opens their ears. Jesus wants you to love with this kind of supernatural agape love, and he's called us to it. He's commanded it of us. This means you can love someone regardless of how they treat you. It does. It means that we can. He wouldn't have commanded us to do something we couldn't do. And you may say, you know what? I don't know if I like the person that sits on the other side of the church. In fact, I sit on this side because I don't really like them, and they're on that side. Jesus did not say that it was optional. You are not commanded to like. You're actually commanded to love, which is above that. I mean, reckless kind of agape. Like you're commanded. And some of you are in here today and you think, I don't even, I don't even love my spouse. <laughs> it's a command, brother. You love that woman. <laughs> It's a command. It is not an option. In fact, you will find that love does something to somebody else. When you start doing your part, the Lord knows this. When we began to love people that maybe in our perception somehow don't deserve it, we're doing what Jesus did. He loved us when we did not deserve it. And it does something to somebody else. They're able to see Jesus. Chapter 13 concludes with three verses, the same chapter that don't seem to fit, but they do. You will see as the story goes. At the end of chapter John 13, verse 36, 38, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you'll follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus answered, die for me. I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even knew me, that you ever knew me. And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. 
Jesus acknowledges that Peter will eventually go the route of suffering. And church history tells us that Peter was crucified actually himself upside down. Regardless though, Jesus makes it clear right then, Peter, it's not your time yet. It's not time yet. But Peter responds to Jesus with courageous words like, but why, I, I, why can't I come now? Like I'll come, like I'm the guy. I'm not like these other apostles. Like, I'm not like these other disciples. Like, I, I'm the guy that will stick with you, Jesus. Even when it's tough, even when it's hard, and even in death, I'm that guy. He believed it. He said, I'm not like these other flaky disciples. You can count on me, Jesus. Peter was one of the inner circles. He was one of the three, Peter, James, and John. Like the tight, the closest friends to Jesus. It was Peter who answered the Lord's question, who do you say that I am? He answered it and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was Peter's confession that the Lord said, on this rock, I will build my church. And it was Peter who stood up to defend Jesus in the garden. It was Peter who followed Jesus with John into the court after his arrest. And it was Peter who ran with John all the way to see the empty tomb. And Jesus answered, die for me, I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times you even knew me. Jesus knew Peter was about to learn that he would need more than a human kind of love. He would need something more powerful beyond that, that he was going to need to be able to do the God kind of things. You know, God calls us to do impossible things because we get to move into the impossible with him. I don't know, maybe people in the world can't love their enemies. Maybe people in the world have limits on their love, but not us. Not us. He calls us in and out into the impossible with him to do the things of God. After Jesus' death, he appears to his disciples over a 40-day period. And this is like a week or so later in John 21. He is a, he has, Jesus appears at the Sea of Galilee it starts out and says, later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and this is how it happened. And basically what happened is, Peter, the sons of Zebedee, Nathaniel, some of the others, there was like a seven of them in total. Peter says, hey, let's go fishing, guys. Let's spend the night out on the water, let's go fishing. So they jumped in the boat with Peter, and they go out, and they spend the night fishing all night long. But it's, it's something that happens sometimes to fishermen, and I know this because my son's a fisherman, that you can fish all night long at prime time, right when all the fish should be biting, and end up catching it nothing. I mean, have a terrible time fishing. And at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who it was. And in verse 5 of 21, it says this, he called out, fellas, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. They threw out the net on the other side of the boat. And yes, when they did, they caught huge fish. In fact, that so many fish, it filled their nets. I mean, it was a fisherman's dream, right? This moment, all oh, these big fish. And it's like, don't let the net break. Oh, don't let the net break. And they, and they pull it in. But then John looks and he realizes he looks out and he says, it's the Lord, because he realized, wait a minute, this isn't normal. Just throwing it, we've been out all night and now it's morning, it's not even as good a time to fish and we throw it out and we can't even hardly pull this in. And he looks out and he goes, it's the Lord, like John the apostle of love, like he recognized, it's the Lord. And then Peter, typical fashion and passion, jumps out of the boat and goes running to shore to see Jesus. Always bo boisterous, always excited. And he runs in. And then the others brought in the huge haul of fish and, and Jesus had breakfast prepared for them. And then we pick up in verse 15, John 21, 15 says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And there's that agape love there. He said that, he said that we just have one word for love, but the Greeks are so much better at this. He said, son of Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you agape me? more than these. And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. But he answered with a lesser love, filio. Then he says, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs, Jesus told him. There's two kinds of love that are contrasted here. We have the agape love, 
which is that God kind of love that is unconditional and it's about others. But here, Peter's answering with the filial love, a kind of love that finds some value and worth in another. It's an affection, a fondness, but it's really about me. It's about what I get out of it. So he's answering him back in a way that's not that crowning kind of agape love. So it's kind of the strange thing that happens there. And then we move on. There's a second question. So Jesus asked him again. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know that I feel you. Then take care of, take care of my sheep, he says. But then there's a third time he asked him, he says, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? He doesn't say agape this time. And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time, but I also probably that he changed the word. Do you filio me? Because he recognized that Peter wasn't saying agape. And then he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I filio. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. The guys, and we have to get the context. The guys had fished all night. They had caught nothing. And then in one moment, Peter had just caught the biggest catch of probably his whole life. Probably his whole fishing career couldn't compare with what just happened. And then they go back on the shore, and they're having breakfast with, breakfast with Jesus. And then he begins to ask these three questions. And then really, we can look at them like this. Peter, do you deeply love me more than these? And then the second question, Peter, do you deeply love me? And then the third question, Peter, do you at least have a genuine affection for me? So question number one, Peter, do you deeply love me more than these? And what were the these that he was talking about? Because some make the uh, assumption that he's talking about the other disciples. Do you love me? More? But we know the, the apostle or the, the apostle of love was sitting there, John. So I don't think he was saying, do you love me more than these other guys? I think he was saying, do you love me more than these things that I do for you? Do you love me more than, 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 than the gifts that I've given you, the blessings that I've given you? Do you love me more than the fact that you just pulled in the bus load, the, the catch of the century just now in one second? Do you love me more than what you get out of it? Because filial love is about what's in it for me. It's a question of Peter's character, and filial love is a little bit lesser. And if Jesus were asking you the same question today, do you deeply love me more than these? What would our answer be? Do you love me more than the good gifts I give you? Do you love me more than the blessings I give you? Is it about the blessings, or is it about you just love me? And the truth is, I think we all start out at filio with the Lord, but I think that the spirit inside of us is moving us toward agape, where it's not about me, what I get, but it's about what can I give? How can I change the world around me? And Jesus was calling Peter into his true identity, I believe in that moment, the ultimate destiny in which Peter, we know, laid down his life for Christ. Think of it this way. Some of you may be single in here. And, and, and maybe you're dating somebody or, or one day you hope to get married. If at that point when you ask them to marry you, their response is, I feel you. You might not want to jump in right then. <laughs> okay? You, you want somebody who's committed and devoted forever. You want an agape a devoted kind of love. And there is a difference. So Jesus asked Peter three times. So there's three asks. And then there's three commissions. We say yes to the Lord that we love him. Then there's something to do. We feed the sheep. We, we, we do something. We take care of it. We love the body of Christ. We're commanded to. Love, feed, do, do actions that show our love. The third time that Peter is grieved over the question of love, but he, but he is grieved over it, but he never pledges a love that he's not sure he has. So we got to respect him for that. 
And I think probably most of us in here are probably a filial love, if we're honest. The author of this story, though, is John. This is the book of John. And who is John? The apostle of love. Like, this is the guy who laid his head on Jesus. Like, he, he calls himself the one Jesus loved. Now you might think that's prideful, but I think he had an experiential knowledge of the love of God. He knew the love of Jesus and he understood it. There was something that he had already grasped. So if, if John's the apostle of love, then I would say that Peter would be the disciple of the jump out of the boat, boisterous walk on the water, kind of make a lot of noise, rowdy disciple. In some ways, they might have been polar opposites. But I believe in this moment, when he gets that question, the reason why he's grieved is he is broken. I mean, you can't be in that moment without remembering just a few days ago, I failed this guy. I, I failed him. I, I didn't agape. I thought I agape. I thought I loved him. I thought I had the kind of love that would lay down my life. But when it came to the moment, I didn't. I didn't have that, and I think he was grieved in his heart. Here's the thing. When they came to arrest Jesus that night, right before Peter had the big fall and felled, you know what he did? He pulled out a sword, right? He was ready to fight. They came for Jesus. I mean, he was like ready to fight. And he didn't like a lot of us. We're ready to fight for Jesus. You know, somebody not living a life for Christ, man, somebody that's far from God, we are ready to fight for what we believe in. Somebody is not in the lifestyle that, that we are living in, we are ready to fight. But that is not what Jesus is asking for. He ain't asking for us to fight. And I think this is where we are in the church and you see it in our culture. We're ready to fight for the Christian values and the Lord is saying, don't fight, lay down in love because they need to see that you love me and that you love them. We gotta quit fighting with them. You know it was those religious Pharisees that are always wanting to fight. And we're not supposed to look like that. We're supposed to show the way of love. They're supposed to meet love. And when God starts sending them in those doors and they're coming in, it's not going to be pretty. And it's just up to us to show them the unconditional love, to love them right where they're at. And there's some mamas and daddies that are counting on you. Because they might not be in this church, but they're praying their kids in. They're in another state. And they're counting on when their babies walk in here that have been so far from God that have messed up their lives so bad. They're counting on they're going to meet the love of Jesus here through you. Think about it. Peter drew out his sword and he wanted to fight for Jesus. Many of us display the same kind of fight over Jesus, over the issues that are contrary to our beliefs, over the lifestyles we're angered about. And Jesus is asking us to die to ourselves and have some genuine compassion. Will we let people make the journey because they're gonna have to walk in and get to filial love first and then move and progress and move, progress into agape? But if we're not in agape love when they get here, what are they gonna meet? There's an illustration in a book I'm currently reading that says this. If your faith is not working, you need to examine your love life. Faith is energized by love. In it, there is by, it's by this evangelist that asked God this question, and this struck me when I read this, and I did something to my heart. He asked God, why God, are you not saving and healing the people? Like, I'm having these services, and God, why are you not saving and healing them? God, why are you not showing people mercy? And he's upset with the God because he thinks like, you know, why, God, why are you not doing this? And God whispers to him, I sent you. You show him mercy. You show him my love. And isn't this the responsibility of the church? It's, I have already, the Lord said, I have already given mercy. I've already shown him mercy. 
Jesus came. He showed you the way. Now you show them. You give them what Jesus has given to you. When we're starting to love them, we will see them healed. We'll see them saved. We'll see them delivered. Things will start happening. But God's not going to send them into a place that's not safe. This has to be a safe place. When faith isn't working, check your love life. The opposite of faith, and here's the thing. You know, we think about the opposite of faith, and I've probably done this myself. I probably have said it. The opposite of faith is doubt. It may be so. Maybe that's true. The opposite of faith is doubt. But, but that if that's true, the enemy of faith is apathy. The enemy of faith is I don't really care. I'm indifferent. So, I mean, either, either I fight and I hate or I really don't care. You know, I've just moved past the lip and let everybody live on the earth just the way they want to live. I really don't care. God hasn't called us to the not care. He hasn't called us to apathy. He's commanded us to love. Faith works by love. Faith. So get this. If faith works by love and you don't love your spouse, your children, the people in this auditorium, you don't love, then I doubt you have a very strong faith. In fact, we need to call our faith into question altogether, don't we? Faith works by love. Faith is expressed by love. Faith is empowered by love. Faith is activated by love. Faith is operated by love. Faith is energized through love. As we operate in greater love, we will have more of his power and we will see people saved, delivered, set free, and changed. Amen? And this is what we're called to. I'm going to ask for you to stand in this auditorium. The people, everyone in here, you're created in the image of God. Even if you're far from God today, you're created in God's image. All human life is created in the image of God. If you know some people that are not living for the Lord, they're still created in the image of God. And you're called to love them. We're called to this. My prayer has been that today, I think I'm Mike, is that the, that the Lord would just ignite our passion again. Ignite our passion. Our calling is not to judge people. It's not to judge one another. We're not commanded to judge. Actually, Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. But we are commanded to love. And he believes we can do it. And if God thinks we can do it, we can do it. It's time to rise up into the agape love. Right? Amen. Before we pray over the people, uh, I want to pull out just a couple more thoughts that you were sharing yesterday. You know, there's not a time in a message where you get everything out, so we've studied for hours and hours. Uh, two, two things that, uh, it, that uh, you connected yesterday or that you were talking to me about. One was that Jesus gave space for Peter to be on his journey. He mm -hmm. knew he wasn't. So talk about that just for a second. Well, I mean, I think Jesus actually, that third question, he came down to... Peter, you feel he owe me, right? And he was okay with that because he, he realized that's where Peter was and it's okay. And it's okay to be where, in that place, but to know that your ultimate destiny, your calling, like you are called to be the people agape love. Good, good point. That's, that's where we're moving to. And, and we're to move with the Lord into that. So we gotta start exercising that kind of love. How do you get there? You start, you start doing it. Well, that's the second question. Yeah. So just a, within days, Peter ends up in the upper room, is filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and then you see him preaching. Preaches and 3,000 converted. Right, yeah. and the love. So it's like Peter didn't have the capacity after his failure to believe he was good enough. I, I think he actually did agape love. I think after I what too. Jesus, what he did, yeah. I think he was still seeing himself as the guy who failed him. That's right. And I, I know that once this, he was actually filled with the Spirit, you know, I, I believe that he and had it. And don't miss the, you know, we talked yeah. about this. Don't miss the, the truths that three times he failed. And so Jesus gives, uh, emphasizes, it says, well, I'll overcome that and gave him three times to remember that encounter yeah. to say, because yeah. agape says we're in covenant. 
So to say we're in covenant. So he removes the failure from Peter's life, so cleanses it in a matter. But he met him where he was at, filial love. No, he absolutely did. He met him right there, and and he wasn't offended by it. He still said, "Feed my sheep." Potentially, the last time Peter had smelled a fire was the chart, the fires that they stood by when he denied Christ, Mm -hmm. and now Jesus builds him a fire. I think it's, 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 it's significant because I think... Even in his failure, he was still called the minister. He's still yes, called the minister, exactly. you know, even though he felt like a failure in that moment. And I, I, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. I mean, we've all, we've all fallen short of. We've all fallen short of. And it's okay. But I do think that the Lord wanted this message to call us... If we're in the fight mode, let's, let's get out of the fight mode. If we're in the apathy mode, let's get out of the apathy mode. Let's begin... To love and those that don't like us and that may be a challenge at home okay but to begin to love the way we're called to love so in your heart why don't you pray over the people this morning that that pastoral kind of prayer that would would accomplish the things and then those that hear it if they know that was for them many people that left the first service just kept saying to me I even have been receiving text during this message people that are changed by this truth and wowed by what the Spirit is saying to them. I believe in a moment we can be changed and we underestimate the The power of God. Absolutely. Yeah, I believe in a moment. You know, I will say if there's anybody here that doesn't know the love of God and you want to experience the love of God, today's your day. Don't leave here. Don't leave here without it. In fact, I'll just play the prayer ministry team. If you have a tag, you have your tags on, come down in here Good. and stand. And then Good. even as I, even if people, long after people walk out of here, if you Excellent. need to experience the love of God, yes. and you just need to feel the love and the perfect love and the acceptance of God, I really believe these people are anointed to give that to you today, to love on you that way today. Or for and I don't any other reasons. Other, other reasons anything, anything that you actually knew, you know you need. And I'm just gonna pray, and I do think it comes, it comes with desire. We gotta want what God wants. We gotta want what he wants. God, I just pray over this church today. Hallelujah. That God, we will begin to want what you want. Yes. God, I pray that the desire and a fire would be ignited and burn off all the apathy and the indifference right off of our lives. Yes. That God, we will begin to move in the love that you have already given us. You gave it to us, we have it. And now you command that we use the love that we've been given. So God, we just make up our minds in this place, Lord, to to operate in the love that was given to us that is unconditional, that is supernatural, that is undeserved. That we love our family, we love this church, and we even love our enemies with the God kind of love this new love that you gave us, God. As you loved us, we choose to love others. We're making up our mind. And God, this week, when the challenge comes our way of love, we're gonna choose love when somebody's yelling at us. We're gonna choose love, Lord, when somebody's screaming. Remind us, Holy Spirit. Remind us of this moment. Remind us, Lord. Let this be a shift in our church into love that welcomes all from afar. That, all, that welcomes all those that are living afar off from your ways that you've called us to. Let them encounter the love of God and may we give them time to journey, to journey into the agape love of God. Now, Lord, remind us and seal this day in our hearts and minds. And God, I ask that you will put a fire in us. Can we just ask God for a fire that burns inside of us, a passion, a love? Lord, your love, God, we ignite this morning, ignite it in us, stir it up in this Holy Spirit, that we leave out of here loving those that reject us, loving those that don't love us, that people are just bewildered by us because we live wide open, fulfilled lives, full of love. Just before these others come down, Uh, Come on down. Just before others uh, come down, if you're here and you say, you know what, Pastor, I accepted Jesus Christ this morning, and uh, and I'm going to make a a public confession. You don't have to, but I'm inviting you. Would you just get out, and the people are going to clap and and welcome you to the family of God as you walk down. Would you do that? Would there even be one? Would there even be one? I'm not sure that there are, but if you're here... 
We have people every week that, that write us, except that somebody you, watching Thank from you, Norway you. last week, and they're tuned in today, somebody watching from Norway accepted Christ over the internet. Can Praise we welcome, God. say hi to Norway? <laughs> We've already connected them with some believers. Amen. So if you need prayer, come on down. Uh, Whitney is just going to sing through this, and we're going we're gonna to pray and... Uh, um, what do you want to do after that, Pastor? You're Let's good? sing a song together. Yeah. Give people time. And if Let's you need prayer that. for anything today, don't leave here without prayer. If you need prayer, they're Let's down, go through this song, here. and then you can feel free to slip out after this. Come on down, and let's have some prayer time. And uh, God bless you. We'll see you Friday night at Carrie Job or next Sunday. Come on, let's pray. And I don't call it understanding When we start to raise our voices the world around us changes. There's a power in our worship. I don't quite understand it. When we start to raise our voices, the world around us changes. So glory, glory, hallelujah. Sing it, church. Go ahead, sing it. Glory Worship him. Thank you for what you've done. We do love you. And we express that through our different voices, and different ways, different expressions. But we love you. We love you. We love you. And we give you praise this morning. Can we just give God praise one more time for what he's done today? I bless you in that matchless, powerful, and wonderful name, the name of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen.